सो ये वीडियो में हम डीबीज लैब का रिसेंटली जो फॉल हुआ है उसके बारे में डिटेल में डिस्कस करेंगे कि क्या रीजन है हिस्टोरिकली अभी क्या चेंज हुआ है ये उनके बिजनेस मॉडल में कोविड का क्या कैसे उसका जो इम्पैक्ट था उसके बारे में डिस्कस करेंगे तो ये वीडियो में वरुण इज विद मी वरुण इज एज अ फार्मा एनालिस्ट इन वैल्यू एडुकेटर सो हाय वरुण उसके बारे में ये क्वार्टर में बेसिकली क्या हुआ था उनके बिजनेस में क्यों फॉल हुआ एंड देन विल ऑल्सो डिस्कस अबाउट की कंपनी का फ्यूचर का प्लान क्या है हाउ दे वॉन्ट टू रिवाइव फ्रॉम दिस डिफिकल्ट फेस एंड क्या क्या ट्रिगर से ये बिजनेस के लिए सो वरुण कैन वी स्टार्ट विद वॉट डीवीज लैब्स बिजनेस इज ऑल अबाउट हाउ दे हैव ग्रोन फ्रॉम द लास्ट मे बी लास्ट टेन फिफ्टीन ईयर्स and then we'll come to the current quarterly mein jo unke margins reduce hue hai and revenue mein decline aaya and what are the reasons for those so divis lab ka agar aap business dekhoge to divis is one of the largest api manufacturers in the world right. in terms of revenue so divis was started on this uh, principle that we do not want to compete with our customers okay so divis is an api manufacturer and they supply these large volume apis to all of these large uh, global manufacturing companies who produce formulations correct right so divis philosophy has always been that we would not compete with our customers and that is why they never entered into the formulation business so this acts as a competitive advantage that they have over other players like loris who have entered into formulations right and they end up competing with the same customers who they sell api So Divis has a dominant market share in a lot of APIs. Some of them like Naproxen, Dextromethorphan, Levetiracetam, and Gabapentin. So these are the products where they have over fifty to seventy percent market share. So they are right. the largest right. producer in the world. Apart from this, they also provide custom synthesis services, and they also have a nutraceuticals business, which currently is small, but they expect it to grow very well in the right. future. So can you like easily or in simple terms make our uh, was explain about custom synthesis because custom synthesis again like uh, there are various names with this uh, thing like some guys call it cramps then CDMO then CMO then CRO just like you uh, know in, in a very brief can you explain about what custom synthesis is and then like there are again two types generic uh, custom synthesis or CDMO and then uh, innovator based cdmo do so how the margins are different in both the segments and how these uh, different words uh, uh, like are, are different from each other right so custom synthesis or cdmo what you would call it is mostly outsourced manufacturing like any kind of activity is that the pharma company they feel that they can outsource it and you know achieve better economies through that uh, they go for outsourced manufacturing so these can be outsourced research services or outsource manufacturing services now there are companies like synge who right. provide outsource research services peramal provides outsource research services and there are players like divis loris who provide outsource suen who provide outsource manufacturing services right, right. right in these outsource manufacturing services also there are two sub parts there is outsource manufacturing for generic companies and there is outsource manufacturing for innovative companies right. now innovative companies have a uh, patents on these drugs so uh, they don't have to face competition right so what happens what ends up happening is they can command very high margins on their products right so as a result the manufacturers for these products the people who uh, manufacture their products on an outsourced basis they can also get better margins because right. they don't have to deal with competitions okay whereas outsourced manufacturing for generic works more on a cost plus 30% margin basis right. Contact, they are mostly called contact manufacturers. Manufacturing for outsourced manufacturing for generic companies usually have about thirty percent gross margins also. Okay. Whereas uh, innovative uh, companies that manufacture for innovative companies can command upwards of seventy percent gross. Right. Margins. So if you check the Suen Pharma margins, gross margins, or EBITDA margins, or even in case of Divis Lab, so these companies used to have a very good gross and EBITDA margins. I think Suen ke case mein it is about forty percent, thirty five to forty percent. Plus uh, gross margins, maybe a little bit. Uh, it is uh, reduced due to the, I think, agrochemical side because I think pharma have a much superior margins compared to agrochemical. Right, 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 right. So let's understand the value chain of the DBS lab first. Like where actually it stands in the value chain. Uh, what are their customers and from when, uh, from which uh, basically customers or suppliers they get their 
raw material. So what is the value chain for the DVs if you can explain more? So the pharma value chain basically starts this way where we start with basic chemicals which are the raw materials or they are also called key starting materials. So these basic chemicals can be commodity chemicals. They can be anything like benzene or phenols or whatever, right? And these chemicals, they then go through like various chemical reactions to become chemical intermediates. Now chemical intermediates can be of two types. They could be regulatory intermediates or non-regulatory intermediates. Regulatory intermediates have to be manufactured in uh, US FDA approved facilities, whereas non-regulatory intermediates can be manufactured in GMB facilities. Now through various reactions of these intermediates and uh, a high level of purification, we get APIs, which is the active pharmaceutical ingredient. So APIs are the main drug that is there in the final tablet or syrup that you consume. It is responsible for the therapeutic effect. So these APIs are then mixed with other inactive ingredients called as excipients to make the final drug. So that is the value chain of uh, pharmaceuticals. Right, right. So initially what you have mentioned that the DVs don't compete with the customers. Yes. That means they are not I- involved in any formulation. They are not. So they manufacture intermediates and APIs as per their customers needs. So they can do this for generics as well as innovative mm-hmm. synthesis business. They manufacture intermediates and APIs but they do not manufacture formulas. So, so that is... Uh, the Laura's business is a little bit different compared to Divis where Laura's is present into APIs as well as into formulations. Right? Yes. So Divis business has three major segments. So the first one is generic API, which contributes to about 45 to 50% of their revenues. The second one is custom synthesis, which also contributes about 45 to 50% of their revenues. And the third one is deuteraceuticals, which contributes about 5 to 10% of their revenues. Now, depending on the customer needs, these uh, percentages change, you know, quarter on quarter, year on year. But in general, uh, custom synthesis has the highest margin. So under uh, generic APIs, they have various APIs in which they have a very dominant market share. In custom synthesis, they do the outsource manufacturing for innovator companies. And under nutraceuticals business, they have a couple of interesting segments that we get into. Right, right. So here my one question is like the big companies like Sun Pharma or Dr. Reddy's or Lupin, they are facing a lot of issues as they have a lot of presence in US markets. And after 2015, if we can check their revenues or profitability, it has significantly got affected. So what do you think, like why it has not happened with DB's lab yet? Uh, till till 2000 or till like last quarter, they have kept on growing their revenues and profitability unlike other formulators or other uh, formulation manufacturers. So the main reason is that Divi's is not into formulation. The pricing pressure or the competition that these companies like Sun Pharma or Cipla or Lupin for that matter are facing is mostly on the formulation side where they have to compete for market share. Right. But Divi's does not have that problem. They can supply API to Sun Pharma also. They can supply the same API to Lupin also. They are not at the end consumer where they have to uh, compete with uh, someone else. Like they can have the high, they can supply to everybody. In this business, scale matters more than marketing. Whereas in the formulation business, marketing is a little bit more important. Uh, Then we can go ahead with the like, what has happened in last four to five quarters? What has been the dependency of the COVID related products with them? basically with their custom synthesis and uh, how the revenue mix has changed. Like uh, initially, I think it was about 50-50 between uh, generic API and custom synthesis. Then uh, it, I think custom synthesis increased a, uh, increased a bit due to COVID side. And again, like it is coming to back to the normal. So can you explain what has happened and how it actually uh, like affected their gross margins or EBITDA margin side? So in the long term, the management has given the guidance that they want to have an equal contribution from the generic API and the custom synthesis. Because in custom synthesis, they don't have control over what they manufacture. It's as per the client's need. Whereas in generic API, they can manufacture whatever they want. So over the long term, the management has said that they want an equal contribution from both of them. But initially, most of their revenue used to come from the generic API segment. Whereas the custom synthesis business has grown a lot recently. Okay. During COVID, they were manufacturing one big product for an innovator right. in the custom synthesis segment, which caused a jump in revenue. So we will get into that shortly. Uh, so what ha- what has happened is as the contribution from custom synthesis has increased in the recent years, the margins for DVs has increased right. a lot because right. it is a much higher bus- uh, margin business compared to the general business. Right, right. 
So I think due to this increased margins, their EBITDA and final profitability has increased. And that's why the stock got re-rated in terms of price to earning or in terms of price to sales. And then market was, I think, thinking that this will remain. And that's why the, like, if you check the all-time high was about 5,300, 5,400 level. And the stock has corrected up to, I think, 2,700, almost 50% there has been a correction in DB's lab. So what is the, what you can say, the normalized margins for the companies like DB's lab or say similar thing has happened with the Laurus also. There has been a good amount of correction. So uh, on a gross margin or on a beta margin, what you think should be the like normalized margin because all the financials will depend on what margins or what future profitability we are considering. So Dr. Moti Devi has always said that over the long term, he envisions the business having about 60% gross margin and about 30-35% EBITDA margins. Right. So that was a little bit higher during COVID due to the increased contribution from custom synthesis. But right now, I believe like the company is coming back to its normalized margins. So let's understand about this margin. So what were their historical gross and EBITDA side margins and what has happened in last uh, couple of quarters or maybe three or four quarters. So can you explain Varun, like what were the margins? And then, uh, like, how the reduction in the margins, so specifically gross margins, has happened. So, what has happened is that the company this quarter has had a very unfavorable product mix compared okay. to like CSM versus uh, the generic margins. So, like we discussed before, the CSM business has actually fallen a lot this quarter, uh, and there was the company has been seeing a lot of price pressure in the generic API segment. Okay. which resulted in a fall in their margin. So what ended up happening was that their realizations fell. But right. what also happened was that the prices for some of their key raw materials, they increased a lot. Like right. if you look at this graph, we can see the prices of iodine and lithium, right. which have gone through the roof. The, ma the management uh, mentioned this as well in the con call that uh, some of the prices have like gone through the roof. And can you also explain about the operating deleverage which has played in this quarter? So which were the capacities which they already created and they are not running at like, like say the full capacities or or where they are not able to utilize them properly. So what has happened on that side? So if you go lower on the PNL statement, there is like a 20% decline in their EBITDA margin this quarter. Your Honor. So what has ended up happening was that the management had created a lot of capacity. They had installed about 400 crores of capex for Molnu Okay. And the de since COVID is over, the demand for this drug has reduced drastically. So what ended up happening is they were sitting on a lot of idle capacity. Now the management is in the process of reorienting their capacities to produce other products in this same uh, facility. What Divish does is they build MPPs, which is uh, multi-product plants. Correct. So they can use the same facility to manufacture other products, but it's going to take them two to three quarters, which resulted in some idle costs and that ended up affecting the EBITDA margins and the right. EBITDA margins was about 20% down. Right, right. So use, well, generally I think DVs used to have a EBITDA margins of about 40%. Yeah, 45%. Right, and this current quarter EBITDA margins were about 24-25% which has been like about 10 quarter or uh, like uh, it was a like multi-year low EBITDA margins the company has, has posted. So what should be the normalized EBITDA margins from which we can do some valuation as we go ahead in this video. So the management has said that it will take them about six to eight quarters to get to 30% EBITDA margin. So I think that could be considered sustainable for the company over the right. long term. However, it's going to take some time for the company to get there. Right. Another thing is I think here the growth has also slowed down and valuations always works based on the like the growth of the company. If the company is say growing at 25 or 30%, the P ratio of the company is generally northwards of 20, 24, 30%. But the day it starts growing lower than 20 or 15%, that valuation multiple also equally contracts. So that is also one of the very important thing one should remember. I think if you check the DV's lab case, man, then the P multiple was probably more than 50 or something and price to sales for was about 10 times or something. So that was a very high multiple which market has assigned just because the market was thinking whatever growth has happened in last say four or six quarters where there was an element of COVID that market was think, thinking like 
this is going to continue in future also and which is not the case right now which market is slowly understanding and that's why i think the stock got corrected by 50 percent and so the multiple are also like contracting so let's discuss a little bit about the what has been a company's growth historically and what it can be in the future right so if we take a look at this graph we can see that the company has been able to compound its sales at 20 percent for the past 10, 11, 12 years, right? Like there has been only this one year in 2018 where the right. company had an import alert from USFDA, where they had a degrowth in revenues. Other than that, if you look at every year, there's 21, 26, 27% growth every year, year on year, right? But this, if you take a look at this graph, here we've plotted the nine months revenues for since 2018. And this is the first year that the company has uh, posted yeah. a decline in their revenues. Excluding the US FDA impact, this has never happened in the history of the company. Right. So the management has also said that we cannot expect the same growth rate that we have seen in the last five to six quarters for the business. Right. right. right? Uh, Pre-COVID, the company was go growing at a slower pace. They were still growing very well, but they were not growing at the pace that they grew for the past two years. And the management has said that now the business is going to go back to the pre-COVID growth phase and pre-COVID margins. Like if you see the 40% margins, they were all achieved during COVID, not before that, before they were in the higher 30s, but they right. were not in the 40s. Right, right, right. So see like here, I think it is a case of valuation versus a business where the business remains same or it will actually improve in future. We'll discuss about their future like the capex about the Kakinada facility and all. So generally what happens is ki markets try to extrapolate the recent past. So if the things are going right, market expect that it will continuously going to be a in, in that similar direction. And then the valuation multiple keeps on increasing. Same thing happens when the, like the business doesn't perform well. So market also expect that this stock or this business not going to perform uh, well for, for quite a some time. And so the valuation multiples will keep declining. So right now we are in that phase when the cycle has turned and the valuation multiples are going down and so the like that is reflected in the stock price also. So let's now understand about like where uh, like was there any kind of an inventory loss which DV's lab has made during the quarter and what is there any potential uh, possibility that in future can they book any loss uh, based on their inventory because I think in case of DVs, they manage or they keep a very, very high amount of inventory, which is, I think, one of our negative point about the company. So, what you can explain about this? Yeah, so what ended up happening is that the management has a philosophy that they need to be able to service the customer anytime they get an order. So, they have a high inventory of raw materials, they keep a high inventory of raw materials and finished goods as well. So, they can ship them as and when they get orders. Right. So right now the prices of raw materials have really skyrocketed and the company is holding a lot of inventory. So as the prices of these raw materials come down, there is a danger that they might have to take a uh, inventory write down over the next few quarters. So that is a very real possibility. This quarter, that impact has not hit the PNL, but right. it could. But and if you check most of the companies, the similar uh, phenomena is happening. Like you take agrochemicals or different pharmaceutical companies, why the margins in these quarters has reduced uh, a lot because the raw material prices started going down. And so whatever raw material or inventory they had initially, that price has actually started correcting. And then uh, finally the business has to flush out that high cost inventory eventually. And on that they might have to take the loss also. That So that might happen in quarter three or that might happen in quarter four, but like more or less, most of the companies will uh, have, have to face this uh, situation. So that one should keep in mind to like understand this business or to value these type of a manufacturing based businesses where there can be sometimes high cost inventory effect, which can uh, come into the p and side, right? So let's, let's discuss about now on a valuations or uh, uh, how the, the stock got re-rated and how the stock is right now de-rating itself. Right. So, uh, we all know that Divi's was trading at a premium valuation. Like at its peak, it was trading at close to a 70 PE right. and about 10, 12 times price to sales. But, and the reason for that high valuation was that the market had baked in like these higher growth rates that the company is going to continue growing at the rate pace that it grew right. during the past two years. 
and it is going to have those 40% EBITDA margins, 40% plus, 70% plus gross margins over the next foreseeable future right. along with, you know, a high sales growth. Right. And what has happened this quarter is that the management has also given commentary that that is not sustainable, that is not going to happen. So I think what is happening is there is being a derating because what is the P ratio? It is expectations of the market. Right. Right. And now the expectations of the market are being tempered. Right. So there is a saying, I think, like when there is a growth company, uh, market sees that growth, the market gives a much, much better valuation if you compare it with any particular bond. Like till that growth happens or continues to happen, that business will be valued much superior compared to any, any particular bond. But when that growth goes away, then market equally gives the very bad, you can say, valuation or very negative valuation compared to bond. So that is the beauty of the market that you can buy 10 rupee thing, uh, you can buy 100 rupee thing for 10 rupees and you can equally sell that 10 rupee thing for 100 rupees. So it's like a pendulum. So we have to be very, very cautious about what valuations we are going to give for a particular company. So business remains same, but valuations can change a lot. And that's why the stock like even DV's lab, I think has corrected about 50% in last probably 10 years, uh, three times it, it has corrected more than 50%. So first was I think in 2008 due to global financial crisis. Then in 2017 when USFDA issue had happened. And third is right now in 2023 because of the higher base and initially the stock has run up a lot because of various COVID high base effect. So this will keep on happening. So that's why we need to have a very clear understanding on our valuation side. I think the buy at any price or the consistent compounding is not actually a case. It it works in particular phase of a market, but not always. So that's why any high quality business, we cannot give the infinite valuation. It has to come at a, a correct valuation or the decent valuation. And then only we can have some margin of safety, which we can have in that particular business. And that is how I think the alpha gets greater over the period. Uh, Varun, let, let's now discuss about what are the future possibilities of the company, what are the triggers, what are the updates do we have for the Kakinada uh, uh, CapEx which was pending from last I think 4-5 years. So what you can say about that? That's right. So the company currently has two units, Unit right. 1 and Unit 2 which are both 500 acres of plot. Right. And in Unit 2 I think they have about 150 acres of vacant land. And I think in uh, unit one, they have about 200 acres of vacant land for future expansion. Right. While having all of this, the company went and acquired another 500 acre plot of land in Kakinada. Right. So, uh, the, but what is what ended up happening was that the local farmers were protesting uh, because, you know, pharmaceutical is a polluting industry and they didn't want them there. Right. So the court case has been going on for like the past four to five years. And finally, the company this quarter got all the regulatory approvals and the land has been handed over to them. So they are in the process of uh, finalizing what they are going to, they are putting their CapEx plan in place right now and they will update us about what they are going to be doing in this facility over the next two to three quarters. So the initial plan is that they'll be spending about a thousand crores uh, to build a new greenfield project at Kakinada and they'll be manufacturing APIs intermediates and KSMs over here. So the APIs that will be manufactured in this facility, uh, initially they will be sold in the ROW markets, the rest of the world markets. Okay. Uh, and uh, while the company waits for regulatory approval, so USFDA, EMA, they take their time to give regulatory approval to the company. So in the meantime, whatever is being produced at the Kakinada facility will be sold in the emerging markets. Right. Whereas, as and when the company gets regulatory approval, they will move the product to the regulated markets. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, the intermediates and the KSMs that the company will be manufacturing here will be consumed captively. So, it can be expected to increase the margins of the company. So, apart from this, the company has also said that they will be investing in newer technologies. So, they will be investing in vapor phase chemistry. They will be investing in continuous flow chemistry and other things like photochemistry. So a lot of these facilities will also be built at the Kakinada facility and over the long term, maybe five or six years, they can be expected to significantly improve the margins for the company. I have heard this term during various companies like vapor, vapor phase chemistry is basically, I think, is done by the clean sciences. 
and you can actually check what margins they command because of that particular technology which others are not able to implement because of the nature of or complexity of the chemistry second is i think the continuous flow chemistry flow chemistry which is again implemented by the companies like tatva chintan if you check like uh, even bigger companies are not able to implement successfully continuous flow chemistry so these uh, terms are also very very important to understand what is the kind of a R&D budget the company have or what is the kind of a technocratic management the company have. That is how we can able to understand the potential future of a company. So again, the DVS lab is like now saying that, that they are going to implement these kind of technologies by which they can keep on reducing their manufacturing costs. And I think the key point or the moat of the DVS is that only like they keep on increasing their capacity and they keep on making the, the cost of production as small as possible. Yes. So Divi's has always been a cost leader in right. whatever they do. And they have always done this by being by having the best technology. So Dr. Right. Murli Divi is always an advocate of having the best in class technology, whether it is for their waste treatment or whether it is for their manufacturing. So up until now the company can command much premium valuations because they have things like you know green chemistry where uh, Dr. Divi talks about a lot about atom chemistry right. in his in the Concord. So he talks about like uh, if they give 10 kg of input, they will try to get at least 9 kg of output out of that. Okay. And the remaining 1 kg that is a waste, they will try to either recycle it or reclaim it in some way. Whereas any other company will put in 10 kg of input and they will get maybe 5 or 6 kg of output. So that gives Divi's much better yields, which allows them to have much higher margins than other API companies. Right, right. And what you talk, like what you can say about why companies like DV's lab uh, generally have the MPB based units uh, instead of uh, uh, and mostly I think it's a batch manufacturing compared to a continuous manufacturing. So is it because uh, because because they have they probably will get a better efficiencies in batch which is not the actual case with continuous. Generally continuous process chemistry have a much bet better yield but it is only a case uh, when like you have to manufacture a particular drug or a particular uh, chemical in very huge volume. So that's why generally chemical continuous uh, chemistry is used. So so despite this reason why DVZ is like going more on a bad side or uh, with the multipurpose plants. So the answer for that is flexibility. So having MPP plants, MPP plants are generally uh, lower in cost to set up than dedicated plants right. and they also give the company flexibility right. that if the demand for one uh, product is reducing and the demand for another product is increasing right. they can just offset they, they won't be sitting on idle capacity because just the demand for this product has reduced right. and over time as older products become obsolete they can shift production to newer products which can have higher margins right. I think this point we can correlate with the, the mostly a commodity kind of a chemicals are manufactured in a continuous based uh, plant because I was reading recently Arti Pharma Labs. So Arti Pharma Labs also mentioned a similar point that they actually have more on and more and more MPPs and they go with the batch uh, based uh, manufacturing while the other companies like say for example Valiant Organics or Arti Drugs where they are more into a commodity type of chemicals like uh, Valiant Organics is coming up with the basically paraminophenol where they actually were trying with the continuous flow chemistry uh, not continuous flow chemistry but continuous manufacturing but eventually they are not able to complete or get the success uh, on that route but if you generally check uh, these high volume based chemicals or drugs are generally manufactured with the continuous flow chemistry same is the case uh, Continuous chemistry. Same is the case with I think RT drugs where they are manufacturing uh, floxacin based uh, different uh, APIs. So there also they use the this continuous based while in the case of say DVS labs or say uh, like RT Pharma labs where the, uh, the product has some niche and they are maybe a low value high volume. Uh, they, they might be low volume high value products and that's why the smaller units or the MPV plants are used. And the batch manufacturing is uh, probably preferred compared to the continuous ones. Now let's understand what can be the future triggers for the DVS lab. So Varun, can you make us understand what are the different triggers the company can have in future? Right. Uh, so over the last year, the company has outlined like six growth engines that they are going to be having for which will help them grow in the future. So the first one is their established generics portfolio. 
so where products like your naproxen or dextromethorphan so these are products where the company already has over 50 to 70 percent market share they are already the dominant uh, player in this segment but the demand for these products are also increasing five to seven percent each year so as they grow like the management is expecting that all that additional demand is also going to come to them right. so that is one growth engine for the company the second is generics with growth potential. So these are products where the company has 20 to 50% market share. So they are not the largest player in it, but they have a significant market share. So these are products like uh, pregabalin and uh, Valsartan, which is a hypertensive drug. So these are products that the company hopes they can be the dominant player in, in five to six years down the line. Right. So they want the 50 to 70% market share in these products as well. So that is the second growth engine. That's where some growth is going to come from. The third one is certain products. So certain drugs are mainly used for hypertension and Divis has a process where they can manufacture it without any pure impurity issue. Right. So what had happened a few years ago is there was an NDMA issue, right. which a lot of drugs were facing. Like uh, in Solara also we saw ranitidine right. and there was another drug called Val Valsartan, which had this impurity issue. But the Valsartan that DVs used to manufacture never had this issue because the process that they have, the NDMA was not formed in the drug. Correct. Correct. So what ended up happening was that uh, DVs was back, fully backward integrated in this product where they were making the uh, intermediate for this API, so, which is called OTBN. So OTBN is the common starting material for all the Sartan drugs. So DVs has decided to enter into the entire range of certain products okay. and they want to be a dominant player in the certain products as well and they are completely backward integrated. Okay. So that is their third growth engine. The fourth growth engine is contrast media. Okay. Now contrast media are drugs which are given to a patient before any sort of imaging is done on them. Okay. That could be an x-ray, a CT scan or an MRI. So these are things that are injected into a blood, into the blood to give a better picture of what is going on. So they give you more contrast in the okay. image. So contrast media can be either iodine based or gadolinium based. Okay. Right. Iodine based contrast media are used for x-rays and CT scans. Whereas gadolinium based contrast media are used for MRIs. Okay. Now the challenge with manufacturing these products are that is that uh, it uses iodine and the prices of iodines have increased three or four times like we saw earlier in this video. Right. Uh, so the only the players with uh, the process that can completely recycle the iodine are best placed to capture a majority of this market and DVs has uh, a process which they can recycle most of the iodine that they use in the manufacturing process so DVs has decided that they will enter into this contrast media uh, business segment and this is a business segment that is growing at 10 to 12 percent a year I think the total capacity is about 3,000, 2,500 to 3,000 metric ton and uh, every year it is it is increasing by about 10% so yes. that like about 200 to 300 metric ton. Right. So uh, same thing with gadolinium based, uh, Son Divis has developed a process where they have the most efficient process for manufacturing the product and they are entering into both the iodine based and the gadolinium based okay. contrast medium. Okay. So, Regarding this contrast media business, the management gave an update during the quarter. So they said that they have two generic products mm -hmm. already in the pipeline and they have one product under the custom synthesis segment. Right, right. And both of these products are going to enter commercial manufacturing over the next two to three quarters. So they are expecting revenues from both of this somewhere around Q124. Okay. Apart from that, uh, in the gadolinium based compounds, they are looking to tie up with the biggest players in this segment. So it is a very concentrated industry. There are only like a handful of big players in this. And Divis is looking to get into long term agreements with all of these players. They are currently in talks. And uh, in some cases, they will be manufacturing the API for these drugs. And in some cases, they'll be manufacturing N minus one or N minus two. Right. What are the other uh, key growth drivers uh, you can you can talk about uh, Divis? Right. Uh, then there is their fifth growth engine which is their future generics so the management has said somewhere between 2023 to 2025 about 20 billion dollars worth of drugs are going off patent and uh, Divis has developed a process 
for a lot of these products which they will be launching very soon right. so about this the management gave an update this quarter where they said that you know they have already filed for some products and some products are in the finishing stages and they will be filing it within a quarter or two right. so they have also given samples to customers for their uh, stability studies and the management has said that as soon as the patents expire they will be ready to launch the product Right. And finally, their last growth engine, which is the custom synthesis business. The management is expecting the custom synthesis business to grow very well, which will also cause further growth. Right. right, right. Uh, so they management said in this quarter that they have two fast track projects, and they are not pandemic related products, and which are about to start commercial production over the next two to three quarters. Okay. So if we can sum up, like what are the reason for this current uh, fall? I think first is the higher base, uh, where the last few quarters uh, revenue and the profitability got elevated along with the margins, and then market expected that it will continue to uh, keep on happening for the next uh, uh, many years. So that was the one reason, and the second important reason was I think uh, uh, the valuation part. So valuations also got got reiterated. So what you what what you personally think like what uh, what are the valuations or currently are you okay with uh, the current valuations are they like a bottom of a basically a cycle or uh, they are probably somewhere in between or midway what is your understanding on the on the valuation side? So as far as this quarter has been like most of the pharmaceutical companies are saying that this is the bottom that they are expecting. Right. But uh, there could be further. Uh, increase in raw material price or further price erosion from here on out. Right. So at the current valuations as well, the V is still a little bit expensive. Right. It is a good stock. It is a great business. It is an index stock. Right. But there could be further corrections if you know the next two quarters are bad right. for the company. Right. So at the current valuations, like it does not provide like much marginal right. security. And I think what will happen is uh, one thing is definitely stock price can price can go down from here on. Uh, what I personally think is it can go into a long consolidation phase because until and unless there is no next trigger which happens to the company, the market is not much interested right now in DV's lab because the growth which the company was going through from, from last couple of years, it is not visible immediately. So market always have some other options where the growth stocks are there. So the whatever investments are there in DVs, they can move it to some other growth stocks. And then whenever that trigger comes to the DVs, again, like the, the re-rating or the, the price will start moving in up, upward direction. So you have to understand between the great business and the great investment. And like uh, along with DVs, there are many other stocks uh, or uh, many other business price has corrected during this correction. So reason can be the business got affected or the reason can be the valuation multiple has gone down. And I think in case of the DVs, definitely the business is very premium business, but it was trading at premium valuation. That's why I think the mean re reversion is right now happening. So mean reversion is again a very, very important thing while you do any, any investment. So I also personally think that right now the valuations are okay, not extremely expensive but uh, definitely not on a value side so i will personally going to wait to take any entry position into a db's lab uh, definitely this price doesn't offer me very high margin of safety and there are many better opportunities which are available in a market so as a investors i think you should always think on a comparative side instead of db's do i have any other company which is probably available at say 15 or 20 p which going to grow at 20 or 30 percent in future so that is always a better case or better alternative it is not like i have to buy uh, dvs i have many other alternatives so i think that is that is uh, what i will conclude uh, according to this episode what what are your thoughts varun like uh, you have studied this company much uh, much in depth and uh, you know uh, what is the capability of the management what is the succession planning of the man uh, like particularly the promoters uh, and uh, the quality of a business and uh, how you rate uh, like the complete company based on the valuation because valuation we cannot ignore at any point of time despite having an excellent business. So as far as quality of the management comes, Divis has the highest quality management like they wouldn't have been able to build such a big business without having a very high quality management. The succession plan is also in place, Dr. Divi, both of his kids are already in the business. Um, 
in terms of the business itself it is a great business it is going to benefit over the long term because of china plus one right. as more and more demand shifts from china to india so there is the long term growth story for the business is still impact but at the current valuations there is better opportunities elsewhere like we could go for a business which is not as high quality as dv but it is trading for much 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 cheaper than its fair value compared to dv which at best you could say today is trading at its fair value right right so i think guys like we can conclude this video with the takeaway that like the best business or the great business and the great investment are two completely different things and we have we are in the game of making our own wealth where we have to go behind a great investment not always a great business definitely we want a great business but at our price not at any particular very high valuation so i think that could be the take away and uh, i think it was a very great uh, learning where we have discussed about the history of the company what has happened in this current quarter and what is the future potential about uh, the divis lab and what is our understanding or our take away based on uh, like the valuations of the company which is on the offer right now so if you like this uh, basically a session and you want some more sessions like that we can definitely do on the loras lab what has happened with the loras lab because it's a also a like a, what you can say lot of discussion is happening on loras lab side also and i think that stock also i think got corrected about uh, 50% so we can discuss uh, similarly on the loras lab or say gufik uh, or bio business in depth so if you are liking this uh, sessions uh, make sure you like this video and let us know about uh, what is your understanding or your thinking on comment section that like uh, what has been your experience with this detailed understanding and quarterly res uh, results uh, whatever we have discussed and if you want it uh, for some other stock you can uh, tell us like which particular stock uh, detail analysis on current results you are expecting or you want we can definitely create a separate video on this uh, side also so make sure you like this video and subscribe to our channel for uh, more upcoming exciting uh, videos in this uh, in this way and uh, we'll will be there with the new newer and newer videos every saturday at 11:00 uh, so make sure you watch uh, this video every saturday thank you